your dear, sweet forgiveness and washing and cleansing. We can be so right, but so wrong. So we ask you to come and be in our midst and bring a righteousness that we might swim in it, that we might bask in your presence, your fellowship, and your mind. Touch us with your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen? Amen. I, uh, over the course of the last, uh, I don't know, a couple of three weeks, uh, I'm, I'm kind of euphoric about desiring. Jackie, I don't know if you know it, Jackie plays the cello. And she's played it for 40 years. She's fairly good on it. And uh, really sounds good when she gets together with other good musicians. And so, you know, my heart has been to find a violin for a stale peanut. That's what Frank calls it. You know, that's where somebody says, how much can I pay you to take this violin away? <laughs> and uh, that's what I look for usually because, uh, you know, I mean, that's I was raised on the poor side of the street, so we don't buy things new. Instead, we, we buy them when other people want you to haul them off. And uh, anyway, I, I found one violin, and uh, then my uh, granddaughter, uh, Tabitha, plays the viola. She played it for about two years, but she'd been out of it for a couple of years. So I was really praying, Lord, would you... Would you find us a, vi a viola for her? Because, see, in my thought process, I'm thinking, oh, how wonderful it would be if they could get the hang of that and we could have our own little music club, you know? I love good symphony music, and I love good symphony or instrumental worship music to the Lord. I just love it. I could just sit in it and drink it. It's just mesmerizing. And... Uh, so uh, I looked here in the United States for that thing on eBay and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, the ones I would find usually started out at 350 and went up to 12000 you know, for a viola. And, of course, you could order one. I don't know what they're made out of from China. <laughs> and uh, But I didn't want to do that. And so... Uh, my neighbor told me that Suzuki makes a, a good instrument, and I told him, well, I'd rather have a Honda. <laughs> so, and he said, you don't know much about instruments, do you? <laughs> no. Uh, anyway, on his recommendation, I, I, I thought, okay, I'll see if I can find a Suzuki violin or viola. And, and, and I... I got on the internet and they started out at about 1500 bucks for one of those, a used one here in the States. And I thought, wow, well, we're not going to be playing the viola. <laughs> and then I really felt like the Lord whispered in my ear, why don't you look at the Canadian eBay? You know, their dollar has dropped 30 percent and they haven't caught up with that yet. And if we could find one just right across the border. So I looked on the Canadian eBay, and sure enough, there was a Suzuki. And he even told me it's the ones built in Nagasaki or Naganani or one of those Japanese places over there. And uh, and sure enough, here here's an ad for one of those. And But it's from Japan. It's from somebody that lives in that Nagasaki or Nugagani or whatever it is over there, you know. And he's got it on the eBay for 50 bucks. And I look at the pictures and I think, well, is that the same? And it's got pictures inside where all the codes are and all that stuff. And I go look up on the internet and it's the same codes as the one here in the U.S. Yeah, it, it's up for bid, you know. And so I, I go ahead and bid on it. And sure enough, I get the bid on it, and he ships it to me. And it's like a brand new violin. It was made in, I think, 1975 at the height of the, the, those guys that were real craftsmen. And I, I, you know, get that puppy in, and we've got it where it's got strings on it. And, you know, it sounded real good when Norm came over and played on it. <laughs> 
Now, the thing is, the guy that had the viola, I saw that he had a violin also. <laughs> and I'm thinking, okay, I, I got Morgan a violin and at a pawn shop. Got my other granddaughter a viola from Naganani or whatever it is. Do, do, do I need another violin? Because, see, I have always, always, as long as I can remember, wanted to play violin. Well, there's the thing. And again, he wanted 50 bucks for one of those, number 330 in manufacturing, if that means anything. A 4x4, four four. I know what 4x4 four four is, you know. That's either a big board or one of them big trucks, so it's got to be a good violin. The thing is, do I want to learn to play the violin? And of course I, I do. I do. So I, okay, it's only 50 bucks, and, and I get it in, and it's like, again, it's, you know, one of those $1,500, $2,000 instruments. It's a used instrument. It's just gorgeous. But do I want to play? Do I want to take time to play? I want to play. Do I want to take time to play it? You know, time is a precious commodity in my life, and which I'm out of. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm overdrawn. <laughs> my bank deficit is real low on time. But inside me, oh, I yearn. You know, because I think I could just get along with the Lord, you know, and just play to Him. Because my heart does that. I hear music all the time. Sometimes when I sing in the Spirit, I, I sing music that I hear. So I have this longing inside this within me. And my whole point being, we have all these instruments of God that we could play. All these instruments of God that we should play. All the things of the Spirit that make this beautiful music in our heart. But do we want to take time to learn how to master those things? Because see, the Spirit came to help us master those things. It didn't come to be a crutch for us to be used. He doesn't like to be used. The Lord sent the word to us that it could be a musical instrument. And how often do we pick it up? How often do we use it to harmonize with the Spirit? How often do we grab hold of it and, and, and love it and have that euphoric hope of a a blended encounter of absolutely holiness, of being in His presence through the revelation of the Spirit in playing the Word. So our study is in the Word. And I hope and pray that you just coming to Bible study is not the limit of your practice of your spiritual instrument. You're supposed to be able to make a melody on your heart that would attract the attention of a living God when He hears the tune played in your heart that He would want to come to earth to be in your presence. Often our melodies are more in a sour note towards the things of life. And I don't know if you know what a sour note sounds like on a violin. It's pretty abrasive. You want earplugs or a long ways away. You want the kid to learn that song way down yonder and play it way down yonder. Well, I hope that you're learning to be in tune instead of hitting sour notes. Get past your personalities. Get past your personal problems. And play a melody in your heart that your God would come and want to know you. That your God would be overjoyed at the joy that was in your heart. So that brings us to our study 
the marvelous book, which is considered one of the highest crescendos about Jesus' preeminence. So we're going to be looking into that in this session. We have covered the first half of... Can you get rid of my team viewer sign there, Frank, or do I just do okay? I can handle that. Well... There was eight of them up. <laughs> so, wow, I'm really technical savvy, huh? We have looked at verses 1 through 14, I think, or 15. Walking in a manner that's worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. That's our overall objective in this study. And the Holy Spirit wrote this to impact us. It has some real impactful things in, in the book of Colossians. It's got the gospel message, which we've reviewed and looked at in chapter 1 through 12. It's got the redemption in chapter 1, 13 through 14. It's got the creation, verses 15 through 17 in chapter 1. It's got the whole preeminence of Christ in the church in chapter 1, verses 8 through 19. And then he gives you the dangers that are of Christ's preeminence that needs to be defended by the Holy Spirit so that we're not in danger. So that we're not in danger. You, re you realize this, this church is in danger because they have some people in there that have infiltrated. They have all kinds of other... I, I was thinking about this earlier today. I started to get a picture of a... Do, do you... Anybody... Have you ever made... Bologna. If you ever made bologna, what you do is take the chicken skin, the chicken livers, the pork livers, pork fat, the gristle, the gizzards, the gooey parts that are on the inside of a pig and a cow that you can't sell over the counter, and you grind those up into a real, real fine soup. And then you add a bunch of pork fat to it for flavor and chicken skin for flavor. And then you add some salt and spices and all that stuff. And voila, you got bloney. You pour that into a tube. It sets up and you cook it or you pre-cook it before you squeeze it in the tube and you got bloney. So... I can tell you they had a bunch of guys there that had taken and they were given some spiritual baloney. They'd been to a meat shop of cuts of religion, cuts of fascism, cuts of uh, philosophies, cuts of narcissism, cuts of well, let's worship other gods, let's put other idols in it. They had repackaged it, they had made it in such a soup that none of the pieces and parts were recognizable, but yet it had a wondrous smell to it. Have you ever fried a piece of bologna? It smells great. And I can tell you most religion is served up by men that are not men of God is baloney. And they had some that infiltrated this church and they're trying to serve baloney for real meat. Scripture is supposed to be real meat. It's supposed to be real red meat. It's got the blood of Jesus in it. It's supposed to be solid substance and no fat added. God said the fat belongs to me. And no hidden parts that you can't see that have been ground up. And no misunderstandings. So in this letter by the Holy Spirit through Paul, to this church. He's putting in, beware of empty philosophies, which we'll be covering when we get in chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. This is a synoptics of what we'll actually be looking at. Beware of religious legalism in chapters 2 through 11 through 17. Beware of man-made disciples. Boy, do we have a world full of those. They say everything's okay and anything's okay. Why? Because Jesus has died for our sins, so it doesn't matter if we sin. Yippee, skippee, we can go sin. I'm afraid that's beware of man-made disciples. It also brings to bear something to us, too. Because these guys pushing baloney in slimy shops that infiltrated the church were getting people to eat that and neglecting their duty to Christ 
And so the Holy Spirit brings in our responsibility in chapters 3 and 4 of Colossians. Our duties in our personal purity before the Lord in chapter 3, verses 1 through 11, which we'll be looking at. It brings our duties in into the Christian fellowship itself to one another. Every part is supposed to supply. And if you're not supplying for the body of Christ, one lady said, well, I supply, I give everybody my two cents worth. <laughs> That's not the supply. The supply means that you come filled with the Spirit and you come with your life in order so that you can earnestly pray and so you can earnestly love and so you can earnestly have something to give. It is true that in the beginning, we're supposed to come to church to receive. But after we've been here for a while, something is supposed to change within us and there's supposed to be so much of the preeminence of Christ within us that we have something to give other than our opinion. We have something to give that came from Jesus. Each one of you can be a holder of that. Chapter 3 also brings out our duty that we have in our own homes. Loving your wives and all that stuff that we see in Ephesians. And wives being obedient to your husbands. And it also brings forth and demonstrates the preeminence of Christ. And puts a duty upon us that we have an obligation to daily work in the kingdom. Daily work in the kingdom. It puts a duty upon us that we're supposed to be a Christian witness. And it puts a duty upon us that we're supposed to be in Christian service in chapter 4. Now, why does Paul come and point that out to them? Because the baloney manufacturers have come in and told them, you got no duties, you got no responsibilities. So the Holy Spirit has really laid something out, not only for them, but for us. But before he puts duty on the table, the Holy Spirit shows us how to maintain ourselves in the presence of the Lord. So our heart wants to run to do those things. It wants to run and fall on his face before the Lord and be pleasing before the Lord. So our duty is not an overpowering task of, oh, well, I guess I have to do one of those. If you feel that way, don't, don't do nothing for God. That's not acceptable. It has to be a joyful in your heart. Oh, God, I want to do something for you. It says, okay, will you do this? Oh, no, I don't do that, thank you. I, I had this in mind. I could sit in that chair over there and pass out cookies. But the bathroom, my bathroom needs cleaning. Oh, don't do bathrooms. So part of our problem is we pick Instead of being able to listen to the Holy Spirit, we pick what we think will elevate us or bring us pleasure or put us in our comfort zone in what we will do for God. We also pick out in our personal relationships of what we will do for God. Well, I'll do this. I'll do my part in this area, this area, and this area. But if that person says this, and you know what means? <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't have to explain it to me. So that's an overview of what this little powerful book has in it. The, 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 the book brings Christ to the center and puts him on a pinnacle far above any other book that we find in the Bible. Far above any other book. Now, you know, I, I've shared with you that Ephesians is the pinnacle of us being able to walk with God in the Spirit. This book focuses right on Jesus and says, I don't know what you're doing, but I want you to know he's Lord of all, he's King of all, he's in charge of all, and you're going to be accountable before him. Why? Because that church that got used to the taste of baloney had blown off a God that they could see, a God they could hear, a God they could walk, off, walk with. And why? Because phony religion was hitting them. It, it wasn't their, their, their desire to do that. Somebody set up their little pork tray and their little burner over there and smoker and, hey, smell the sausage. Ah, oh, it smells good. And the pastor identified that it was baloney 
and some some would not listen to him. I can't say all because Paul is writing to those who will listen. So we do have a branch that will listen. And we do have a branch that he's addressing so that they can come away from the baloney. So what do we call this message? Baloney? <laughs> How to identify baloney. So with that, let's jump into Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, surprisingly. He is the image of the invisible God. Now, why is Paul making that statement? Because the Nicolaitans that were there, the legalistics, which the Nicolaitans were early on, like the Gnostics, which had to do with Greek thinking, Greek philosophy, that if you held knowledge, you were the holder of truth. And if you held religious knowledge, then you were the holder of God, and you had all of his knowledge, then you were the one that was supposed to make the way for others to gain religious knowledge. So much so was it that Paul visited the hill at Mars Hill, and he told them, and when he got to the resurrection of the dead, uh, ah, we don't believe that, get out of here. Because they truly thought that if they could think through it in their philosophy, if they could just think through how to build the pyramids and not experientially go out and do it, that they were the apostles of knowledge, including God's knowledge. That they didn't have to experience it. So they didn't believe that there should have to be any experience in relationship with God. Does that sound pretty familiar? They didn't believe in him as being preeminent, that, that they really had to serve him. He was just another god like the, like the other gods that they served. That, oh, okay, well, Zeus wants this. Uh, okay, yeah, his priests kind of need this. We'll send down a ham for him. And, and, and yeah, we, got, we, we, we gave. You know, they had the little giving cards, no doubt, that they sent out and all that stuff. And so Paul is making a statement that Jesus, he was real. He is here. And he is the image of a living God in our presence. Something they didn't believe, and something they had ground up so fine that their objectivity was to overcome the believer with speculation. Uh, we want to go to First John. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Now, that saw is kind of a past tense in our thinking, but it's not in the Greek it's saw, seen, it's your seeing, you're observing, you can see it, you can see it. It's it not saying something that you've seen in the past. And we see his glory. His glory is, is exploding. And he's, he's the glory of the only begotten from the Father. And he's full of grace, caress. <laughs> and caress is always something that is spiritual and becomes physical. Caress, God created the heavens and the earth beginning with his logos, but his charis was the active part of that and the power structure connected to the Holy Spirit that hovered over the earth. And the power of that developed the earth. And so he's also full of aletheo. Again, what was that? What's aletheo? Anybody remember? Reality. Ah, real. He's real. He's real. So... John himself is making those implications, which backs up what Paul is giving to us. The image of God reflects upon Adam as Christ. I want to back up here, because it says in the second part of this that he's the firstborn. Well, how could he be the firstborn? Adam was before him. How, how could he be the firstborn? But yet the scripture says he's the firstborn in all creation. In all creation. Now, if that's not a paradox that really gets your mind going. But yet, I believe God in his word. And of course, he, he, he tells us in other passages 
in Genesis 1 and 27. We have, and, and we have the Adam typology in Psalms 8 that Jesus is, or the Messiah will be after that pattern, but not the broken pattern. Hebrews 2 and 5, again, it refers to Christ as the second Adam, in which Christ is viewed as the first true man to fulfill God's design in creation. You realize Adam didn't fulfill God's design. And in not fulfilling God's design, he wasn't one of his sons. Why he got cut out of the picture, he didn't fulfill God's design. So Jesus, therefore, fulfilled God's design. He's the first, he was the first man to fulfill God's design. Thus, to be in the image of Christ is the goal of all Christians. If Jesus was the image of the Father to accomplish the Father's will, we're supposed to be made in His image to accomplish the will of Jesus Himself. And there's a few passages of Scripture that you can look up that will help reinforce that. And some of it will flat kick your teeth out <laughs> about becoming a child of God, about, about being a son of God, about owning up to our responsibilities of being a, a child of His. And it lays heartily out the responsibilities. We don't have time to chase those, although I, I wished I did because the inference in this about him being the firstborn, which he's the forerunner going before us, and the invitation is based upon that he made it. Invitation is based upon that he's the firstborn, so it plays a great significance of us being born again, of us becoming like Christ, of having this typology in our mind and understanding in our mind and revelation in our mind that comes through the Spirit that that's what we want to become like. Someone who can achieve the goals of Jesus here on earth. If you belong to Him, your body's supposed to belong to Him. Your, he took on your body that needed to die on the cross. Pretty brutal. But He says, here's the deal. I get to live in your body and get to drag it where I want. And you don't get to drag it where you want. And I get to use your mouth. And oh yeah, I don't like that guttural stuff coming out of your mouth. And I don't like your attitudes. My brain is supposed to be, my mind's supposed to be there. What's all this rattling noise about that I hear in here? Get that stuff out of here. We've got a lot of explanation when we stand before him. A lot of duties, a lot of responsibilities. And yes, he's made the way because we could not do these things on our own. So he realized that. And they realize your, your mind's stuffed full of straw, and we, we're like the straw man. Oh, oh no. Oh, <laughs> you know, stuffing stuff back in all the time. But he's come to get the stuff out so he can occupy his building. His building. You need to dethrone yourself. Now, that's something that the Nicolaitans and the other religious people were trying to do, and the Gnostics, if you want to call them that, they were the early inceptions of the Gnostics, or Gnosticism, that came from the philosophies of the Greek, long before the Gnostics showed up in Alexandria, about 300 A.D. This is, this is, this is back in about 60 A.D. Paul uses the word image to mean an exact representation and revelation in this. When he says that the image is supposed to reflect the glory, the Im he, he, it, what he's saying is Paul's using, it's supposed to be an exact representation and revelation. So if Jesus was an exact representation and revelation of his Father, what are we supposed to be? In an exact representation of Jesus. What would Jesus do? And a revelation of Jesus. If you're a revelation of Jesus, which a whole church is supposed to come into that. Every person is supposed to become a revelation of Jesus. And you, you, you do that by doing what the Lord wants you to do. You do that by going through hard times and Jesus being there. I remember one time back when I'd been married, I don't know, probably about a year or something like that, and uh, at a lumber yard, and we had sold all of our mobile homes that we had in there for sale, and the Lord asked me, we live in one, we, and we sold it too, and the Lord asked me, uh, Curtis, uh, would you live in a tent? For me inside one of the bays here 
If you do, I'll come and see you. I said, yes, Lord. Oh, but I'm married. I got a wife. <laughs> I don't know about her. <laughs> well, you better go find out. And oh, yeah. Tell her that if you do, I'll come. I, yes, Lord. Oh, Jackie, I, I was talking with the Lord, and, and I know we're, we live in this mobile home, and we just sold it, and we've got money. We can go rent a house or and all that good stuff. But the Lord said if we set up our big two-room tent in one of these bays, and I got all this carpet, we can roll it out. And we had a really nice tent. We love camping and all that stuff. And he, he said he would come. She said, he said he would come. Yeah, he'll come. Boy, we were quick to set that tent up, and we were joyful. We were joyful. Why? Because God said he would come. And man, I, I'm, when I camp, I'm, I, I, I camp. <laughs> and I'm well restrained in the way I want to camp. <laughs> it should look like, you know, I, I must have some Arabian in me because I want to set up one of those huge tents with the, you know, the, Cow, in, in matter of fact, I did. I, we had in the one side of the tent we had our living room suit, and the other side of the tent we had our bed and chest of drawers in there and all that stuff. And we were in there and just, oh Lord, this is so wonderful. Thank you so much. And it, in in one of those bays, it's just open on one side, and a bay was running lengthways. It was probably 150 feet long on this side of the lumber yard, and then there's big open space in the middle, another 150 foot building on that side and probably a 80-foot building on this end. And so we, we're up in that bay, and we're laying there praying and talking to each other and delighting our hearts in the Lord. And there was this, we're laying there in bed facing that way, which the, the, bay, the building goes on that way. We're inside. And all of a sudden, that side of the tent started getting brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter. And so bright, it was like if someone had a lantern and they were standing right next to it, and even the sides of the... And this is a big, heavy canvas tent. This is not one of those little cheapy mountain tents. This is a, this is a cowboy macho gacho tent, you know? And, and that light's coming through. It's dark canvas. Dark oiled canvas. And we're sitting there giggling, and Lord... Is that you? And I, I jump out of the bed and I run out and unzip the one and go into the next room, unzip the next and, and look outside and look where the lights come from and there's no light out there. I look back in the tent and it's lit. I look back outside. It's dark. Jackie, come here. <laughs> she comes running and she pokes her head out and look. It's dark. We look, there's no light shining. We look inside. And we go back in and settle in. Lord, is that you? And he talked to us for three or four hours. We didn't want to go to sleep. Jesus is the exact representation of his father. And he's the revelation of his father. And if I'm walking with Jesus, I'm supposed to act like him, walk like him, talk like him. And if you know me, there should be some sort of revelation that's coming to you that he's real. There should be some sort of light coming out of me that he's real if I'm in his revelation. If everybody was enlarged like that and had those experiences, that's what draws people to Jesus. We're supposed to be the light. And the light is the revelation of Him that you walk in. But too often, we're hit with the baloney factories that we don't have to be that, and we can do our own thing our own way and practice our own religion to our own chagrin. The writer of Hebrews affirms that Jesus Christ is the express image of his person. The express image in Hebrews 1 and 3. And we, I think we read that, didn't you? And he is the radiance of the glory and the exact representation of his nature. But radiance and his nature and upholds 
all things by the word of his power. Now I ask you, do you need a little upholding? Not upholding what you want, not upholding what you demand. How about upholding so you can become obedient? Faith is our obedience to him. Faith is not trusting him to do something for us. Faith and faithfulness are the same, and that means that we're obedient to him. If we're obedient to him, then we can say we're in the faith. But if we're not obedient, we can't say that we're in the faith. Jesus was able to say, he who hath seen me has seen the Father. And you realize this, this is what Paul is relaying in this book of Colossians. He's relaying that he's the, he is the Messiah. He is the king. He, he is the one that is in charge of everything. Why? Because they're demoting him and demoting him. In essence, God is invisible, but Jesus Christ reveals himself to us, and he reveals the Father to us, but that all happens through the Spirit. If you don't want to listen to the Spirit, you're not going to get to see either one of them. That world gets closed off to you. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as to yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we'll be like him. Now, how many of you just went to the end time when he appears? This, 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 this whole chapter has got nothing to do with the end time. It has to do with the here and now. And it has to do with the great appearing of our Lord Jesus that we need. We need because if he reveals himself to us, then when, every time I see him, it changes me a little bit more. I'm not changed in my own flesh. I'm not changed by studying. I'm not changed by doing Bible studies. I'm changed by the revelation of Him that comes and is appearing and me following Him. Oh, Lord, I failed you once again, but you're here. Oh, you're here. And when He is, and He can help me become like Him because I can't do it. When He does, just when we see him, just as he is. These are some dimensional things that we're talking of. And we're going to get into that because the scripture we're going to be going into. In 1 John 3 and 4, and completing that, and everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Oh, wait a minute. Hey, you mean I got some responsibilities? I, I thought Jesus, to, why, why do I have to purify myself? Uh, why do I have to stop wallowing in the mud like a hog? And why do I have to stop grunting? And why do I have to... Why? Because we're supposed to have a hope of His appearing at any moment, any second of Him standing here and rescuing us from those things that are going to bring destruction and our termination of the revelation of Him. If, if we have our hope fixed on that, if I, 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 I must see you, Lord, I must see you, then I'm going to keep my heart clean, my mind clean. And that doesn't mean I'm not going to fall in the mud. Falling in the mud, sheep do that often. Goats like to dance in it, but pigs live in it. And if you want to live in it, you're a pig. If you want to dance in it and just play in it and splash it on others, you're a goat. But if you hate it when you get all this filth of life on you, you're a sheep and Jesus wants to deliver you from it. He wants to deliver you. That everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sin, and in him there is no sin. Now, I've heard that say, oh, well, Jesus came. See, he took the sin away. He knew I was a sinner, and he took it away. And, and not only that, uh, and in him, there, there's no sin in him. Well, no, there's not any sin in him. But what is, is there any sin in you? Is there any sin in me? I would say yes to that. And if I say yes to that, then listen to the rest of this. This is a continuing thought. No one abides who abides in him. And we're supposed to abide in him, right? I mean, you, you know that. No one who abides in him continues to sin. And no one who sins, in some of the translations, it, it, it has this has seen, which again, that puts it in the past, doesn't it? 
But the word is hurao, him or knows him. So it, no one abides in him, continues to sin. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Uh, if you have a, a King James or NIV, that's, that's kind of what it says. It may dance around those words. But I look, I, let's look up that hararo and find out what that means in the Greek. It's to see face to face, meaning to see and converse with and have per personal acquaintance and fellowship with. That's a pretty serious word, right? So why don't we plug in the context of the definition of the Greek word into that scripture. No one who abides with him continues to sin. No one who sins will see him face to face, meaning to see and converse with him and have per personal acquaintance and fellowship with him or know him. That gets pretty serious, doesn't it? So do you want to see him face to face? See, that's supposed to be the hope of us. But I can tell you, as a true Baptist evangelical, we always threw that to the end of time when Jesus would come in the second coming, and we didn't, because we were taught that, oh, he didn't speak anymore, he didn't, he didn't show himself, he, he didn't do it, he stopped doing all those things. No, he didn't, he's God. And how can he stop being himself? He, he said, I'll be the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he was revealing himself when he made the earth. He was revealing himself when he raised up his prophets. He was revealing himself when Jesus came. He was really re revealing himself to his apostles. And he's never stopped revealing himself because the Holy Spirit now is his complete representation here on the earth. How could he stop? The only thing that could stop him is our misteaching of eating somebody else's baloney that they've remanufactured. And we miss the whole key thing of knowing him face to face. John, 1 John 3, 7 and 10. Little children, we make sure no one, make sure no one deceives you. That means we can be deceived, right? The one who practices righteousness is righteous. Just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. If you've got works of the devil and you, God wants to destroy those works and set you free. But you've got to understand he wants to destroy the devil. Which means you've got to get off his team. Because the devil loses. And the devil is out to destroy you. And the devil is out to cast you down. And the, the reason I'm bringing this in is because Paul was dealing with this in this Colossae church. Because uh, if we went over to the book of Revelation, we'd see some of the things of Nicolaitan. And you'd realize that's one practice of religion. Jesus didn't talk about the Buddhist. He didn't talk about all. He didn't talk about anything else that he hated. And there was lots of other so-called demagogues or demon gods that were on the earth. Zeus, Aphrodite, all those guys. He didn't mention them once. But the Nicolaitans, he said, I hate the Nicolaitans. I hate the practice of the Nicolaitans. And boy, you talk about a strong statement. If God says he hates something, boy, we ought to be running from it and not even standing on the ground. And they had infiltrated that church and destroyed it, the church of Laodicea, which God had. Jesus had, the Holy Spirit had nothing to say, good to say about the Laodicean church. Nothing. And their lampstand was removed. I know, there's this blunty theology out there that you can't lose your lampstand. Well, I'd submit to you that the baloney factory doesn't even have a lamp stand to give you. How can you lose that which you never had? And we practice that by being in the express image of Jesus Christ, and then we have something. If we practice being in the express image of Jesus Christ, it's up to me to practice that, not my wife. It's up to me to practice that for my relationship between me and God, not for me to practice it between me and God, for God to do something between me and Jackie. Either I'm going to do it solely for him and solely because he says do it, or I don't love him. And I'll be walking in my own flesh. Did I read this? No one is, yes I did, I said yes, but the children have got, well we, now we read it. As the Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil, no one who is born of God practices sin. Are you born of God? 
Do you practice sin? Some of us do sometimes. And what, what's, what's the remedy? Stop. He said, if you're stealing, stop stealing. If you're lying, stop lying. Call it what it is. If you're angry, stop being angry. If you're hateful, stop being hateful. If you're unloving, stop being unloving. If you're acting unrighteously and stupid, stop being stupid. If you're being a jerk, stop being a jerk. You know, our, our jerkology club is, is pretty strong. It's stronger than our theology club. The theology club, walking with God, and doing things his way, says don't be a jerk. And we've got all these butt clauses in there. I remind you, a goat's got horns and he butts with them. But, uh, but you don't know, but, but, but. It, it, I can tell you in Texas, the goats are really enjoyed. It's called bur baristos or something like that. I, I remember going into Uncle Julio's, a Mexican restaurant, and, and they, uh, they, they had some goat fajitas. And I said, well, I, I, I'll try that. They brought out a plate that was about two foot long with a big old honking, the whole goat leg hanging off of both ends. <laughs> That, that that's where you end up if you want to be a goat. Julio's, Texas. Great fajitas, by the way. But this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. It's obvious when we act like the children of the devil. What did Jesus say to Peter when he acted like a child of Satan? Get behind me, devil. Flashpoint. And do you realize it was right after he said, Oh, blessed are you, Simon Peter, for God to fight. He's the one that showed you this. This, this is revelation, and that's what my church is going to be on. And then he says, And the Son of Man's going to be hauled off and killed. No, no, I'll defend you with my sword. Get behind me, Satan. I mean, that was basically the scene. One minute he's with God and a child of God, and the next minute he's an agent of Satan. Is that us? Hello? It is. And that, did Jesus know that? He did. And so he wants us to be at least able to identify instead of getting into excusatology. At least identify. The last half hour, I was a child of hell. God, help me. Am I being too loud out there? Is if, if we go to him and, oh, God, help me. He helps us. He, he knows the state that we're in. He wants to help us. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God. Now, do you know where this starts, is practicing righteousness? Is with your wife and with your husband. Because if you can't do it there, you're not going to do it. Every, every place else to cover up because they don't know you. They don't see your laundry hanging on the line. They don't hear the whiplash of your tongue and the cracking of the whip and the sword coming. You know, there's two people that fight with a sword in their mouth. One of them is Jesus at the end against the devil, and the other is us against each other. And so, suck it up and bring it under control. And come and be like Jesus and get it under control. And stop being a jerk in this life. And start living for your Lord. Living full of laughter, full of love, full of honesty, full of purity. And showing it. you got a duty to show it. If you're not showing it, something's wrong. And you're not exhibiting it like Jesus Christ wants you to exhibit it. I'm making myself nervous. And of course, anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God. So we're, let's face it, we're in and out. We're phasing in and out. That's why we're not supposed to be the, belong to the in and out burger club. Instead, we're supposed to go in and stay in and go deeper and go deeper and go deeper and go deeper. We're supposed to go from one great revelation of God to the next great revelation of God to the next great. We're supposed to go from one truth to the next truth, and then get into Aletheia where our truth becomes real in Him. We're supposed to go from that to that to that. 
not back into the pig pen. And, and if you get in the pig pen, and I know most baloney theology today says it's okay to be in the pig pen. It's not. We just got through reading. It's not. And if you're in the pig pen, you're going to end up being a child of the devil, and the devil gets thrown into the pit where that's where he roast the hot dog, and all of his little piglets go with him. A tough sermon, isn't it? He is the image of the invisible God and the firstborn of all creation. Firstborn, that's protocos. That's where we kind of get our word from prototype. You know what prototype is? You, you make the first and, yes, that's perfect. And I want everything to be made like that. Jesus is that prototype. The reference of firstborn is not one of talking about his origins. We know Adam was born first. But rather he's talking about his priority of position. You can find that in Romans 8.29, Revelation 1.5, Hebrew 1.6. Firstborn of all creation equals prior to all creation. Wow. You can find that in Revelation 3, 14, John 1, and 1 through 3. Prior to all creation. So when it says firstborn, it means Jesus was prior to all creation because before God ever spoke and made one toad here on the earth or one frog or one chicken, it says he was firstborn of all what? Before he made one tree, before he made one cactus, before he made anything, he was the firstborn of all creation. Now, the Aranese, those were a particular religious sect back then. They thought it meant first of a kind, which was incorrect. And some of that was being taught also through the Nicolaitans, through the Gnosticism, and through the legalism that was being trying to come into this church that Christ was the first creature. That, that can't be right because he's not a creature. He's not creation. He's a creator. The word can be substituted to have that meaning, but Romans 8.29 kind of Stands everything that's on our ear and says Paul's right. But such reading is not consistent with the theme that the Holy Spirit is bringing through Paul. Which here he stresses a messianic priority and preeminence. A messianic priority and preeminence. Romans 29.30 For those whom he foreknew he also predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn amongst many brethren. So it's important that he be the firstborn because elsewise we don't get to be the brethren. Why? Because the firstborn is the one that has preeminence with the father. Remember he gets the double portion. Why? Because we're his bride and he's going to need it. We're we have a we're he, we're needy bride. <laughs> and many many problems. Our hair curlers have fried our hair several times. And these whom he predestinated, he also called. So out of him being first poor, first born, now he predestinated you. If you're calling upon, but he 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 call, he's calling you. You call upon him, then he calls upon you. And these he called. If you respond and say yes, Lord, I'll do it your way. Yes, Lord, I won't get the last word in. Yes, Lord, I won't be a jerk. Yes, Lord, I won't be hostile. If you respond to the call, what is his call? His call is stop doing that. His call is come to me and come out of that. His call is come and be transformed. And when you step his way and you decide not to do it your way or the devil's way and win the fight, then he'll justify you. And these whom he justified, he will also glorify. You know what glorify means? Glorify means you can feel him standing next to you. His glory always had a radiance to it. Why? Because he's preeminent. He, he's, and we're going to talk about that. Firstborn, it's positional. Heir and preeminent one. Not necessarily the one born first. Ishmael was born first. He was rejected by God, hated by God. Isaac was born second. He was considered Abraham's firstborn, and even says so in Scripture. Esau 
was the firstborn, but Jacob was the spiritual son. He was the one that became firstborn, and Ishmael's not even recognized in the lineage as far as firstborn. Why? Because he's cursed. Reuben, same with Joseph, Manasseh and Ephraim. Joseph's leaning on his staff, Manasseh and Ephraim there, and Jacob reverses his hands, and his son said, no, 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 you don't understand. I know you're blind, but this is on this side. No, no, you don't understand. This is the firstborn. The first Adam versus the last Adam, pre-existence. And you can find that in Mike, Micah 5, 2. There's some comments about that. The only begotten. That, that's about Jesus. It's listed five times in Scripture in the New Testament. In 1 John 1, 14. And you can get the rest of the reference. John 4, 9. Isaac also was called the firstborn of Abraham. And he was called Abraham's only begotten. Why? Because Christ was a type and shadow of Isaac. Remember, Isaac laid down his life. And said, here I am, Dad. I'll help you gather the firewood. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, Let not let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. Now, how many of you thought that uh, Yul Brynner in the, the Ten Commandments told Moses. Now, you remember his statement? He said, well, I'll require your firstborn. And Moses in the scene said, oh, you just brought the curse upon him. No, God's the one that brought it upon him. And, and then you realize Pharaoh is a type of Satan. And God wants Satan to let his son go. His sons. And he even refers to him, my son, Israel which was Jacob. Jacob, the cheater, his name got churned into Israel. So if you're a cheater, your name can be churned into his beloved and becoming one of his child. But the thing is that it, he was a firstborn. I have found David my servant, this is Psalms 89, 20. I found David my servant with my holy oil, I have anointed him. With whom my hand shall be established, my arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. And I will beat down his foes because before his face, and I will plague them that hate him. My faithfulness, this is Psalms 89, 24 through 20. My faithfulness and my loving kindness will be with him. And in my name, his horn will be exalted. And I shall also set my hand on the sea at his right hand on the river. Now, why am I reading this? Because in, in there was the firstborn. In there was the firstborn. He will cry to me, and you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation, and I also shall make him my firstborn. Do you realize Jesus was made his firstborn? Now, I don't have all the semantics on that, but if God said it, I believe it. And you know why he made him the firstborn? Because he was obedient and carried out Project God here on earth to redeem mankind. He prayed in the garden. Is there any other way? Father said, nope. Prayed again until he sweat and blood. Is there any other way? Nope. Prayed three times. And finally, it's not my will, but yours be done, O oh Father. He accepted the charge. He could have backed out right then and been another failure. And we'd still be waiting on the Messiah. He's the highest of all the kings. He said, my mercy in Psalms 89, 28, 29. My mercy will I keep for him, for everyone, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed also I will make to endure forever. Are you his seed? And his throne as the days of heaven. For by him, this is in Colossians 1 and 16, we finally made it through one passage of scripture. <laughs> and what, and what's the time? We got... How long do we go? Pardon? 
I got 60 slides and we're in like, like we're eight. <laughs> uh, well, we'll, we'll, we'll tackle. For by him were all things created that are in the heavens, that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities and powers, and all things were created by him and for him. You realize what the baloney factory was saying? Oh, he's not really the creator. And there's not anything that's invisible. We can, we can see what God's will is. And there, there aren't any real thrones in charge. And if they are, they're angels. And we worship the angels now so they can get on our side. You realize they deified Paul and deified Peter also and prayed to their statues because they had gone to heaven and become an angel and they were worshiping them. They had a worship of angels. That was part of the Gnostic practice and part of the Nicolaitan practice. And so Paul's coming in and saying, are you nuts? Everything's under him, including these so-called principalities and powers, including the dominions and all the principalities. All things are created by him and all things are created for him because the baloney factories had come in and said, no, it was created for man and we'll be like God and we'll become God and we're the sons of God. But without coming through Jesus, who is the firstborn, because if you don't go to him as the firstborn, you can't be born into the family of God. He's the one that brings us into the family of God. All things, including Satan. Do you realize Jesus made Satan? The Mormons don't believe that. They think that Satan was Jesus' brother. They don't believe that he was a created being. And they honestly think at the end that God is going to forgive Jesus' brother and Jesus is going to make arrangements for his brother to come back into the heavens. And I think, you don't believe in the deity of Christ and you think Satan's equal to him? He's a created being to fulfill what Jesus wanted to accomplish here on the earth. And, and here's the thing that these guys were doing, the baloney factories. They were saying that there's cosmic powers and getting everybody stirred up. Yeah, there's all kinds of cosmic powers and cosmic energy and crystals and this and that. And I, I see it all the time. So-called reputable people that work in our society, getting others hooked on all kinds of weird stuff. Electronic things, waves, radiant waves, and, and, and crystals, and oh, if you hang this up and do this, and that's, uh, yeah, that's a practice of witchcraft. Whatever cosmic powers they're offering, they have nothing to offer a Christian. Nothing. And they can deny a Christian nothing. Why? Because they're not preeminent. But Christ has all things to offer to his children. All things to offer to his children. If we will only be his children. Romans 8, 38, Ephesians 1 and 10. Romans 8, 38, For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Jesus Christ. Nothing can separate you except your two little feet and your pointed little head when it gets horns on it and says, I'm a goat. Yet you realize nothing else can. It didn't say you couldn't. You can make a decision to jump out of God's hand. You can make a decision why? because he gave you free will. And I meet many people that allegedly walk with Christ for years and years and years. And in their closing years or mid-years, they walk away. They walk away. And they don't want Jesus in their life. I don't want God in their life. They, what they don't want is God to interfere with what they want. They finally have put their will ahead of what he wants. You got tired of wrestling. Oh, you just want me to do not to do too much. I had a friend of mine I worked with out in the Gulf of Mexico. His name was Levon Hicks. He had a brother named Charles Hicks. And they were the two wildest men I have ever met in my life. They were ex-football players. They should have been convicts. 
One was 6'8", and the other one was 6'9". Their arms were big around as my legs from pumping iron. And they loved to fight and they loved to hurt people. All they did was go out and get drunk and hurt people. And literally, I'd be listening to them. Yeah, that guy smarted off to me and I grabbed him up and stuck his head right down the toilet until he was almost drowned. They talk about things like that. And they, these guys, I work side by side with these guys. We became friends because we six of us slept in one small room with bunk beds in it. And they'd say to me, Curtis, man, we really like you. Why don't you just come spend time with us out the lake? We got a lake house, big jet boat and all that stuff. And you don't have to party with us. Just, 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 just come be with us because we like to be around you. And yeah, you can do that pray thing, bring your Bible, you know, but it didn't mean anything to us. And I really fell in love with this one guy, not in a sense of a girl, but he was just a great guy, but mean. I didn't like that about him. And I said, LaVon, I have got to tell you, you're not going to heaven. Said, oh, I know that. Well, you, you know where you're going then? Oh, yeah, hell. Yeah, I'm going to hell. I'm doing a good job at it. And I, I, I said, well, I, I don't want you to go there. I really like you. And he said, well, i got plans to change it, you know. When I get all the partying out of my system, all the women out of my system, the drugs and all that stuff, when I get through that and get older, you know, I'll, I'll probably take on some kind of religion. Meanwhile, you know, I can just hang together. I'm sorry, LaVon. You, you made your decision. You made your decision. His brother was ten times meaner than snot. Hurt people bad. Real bad. I met LaVon about probably... 15 years after Jack and I got married. And he, they know my shoulder and was crying. Boo-hoo and big tears. This is a big man, this brawny. Curtis, I killed my brother. I killed him. I chained him to a wellhead and cut off his fingers and pulled out his teeth. I need help. I said, LaVon, I know somebody can help you. I said, it's the Lord. <coughs> I, I, no, I, I'm not ready to do that. Now, when I get ready, Curtis, you'll be the one I call. I'm still waiting on his call. But unfortunately, between now and then, he might be the next one to be chained up to a well hit and those things happen because they run with a wild bunch, wild bunch. Now, my whole purpose in telling you that is because we're supposed to be filled with the love of God and we're supposed to be able to influence those. We're not supposed to live like the devil. If you want to live like the devil, you got some consequences that you're going to have to reap. But if you want to live as a child of God, the instructions that are here in Colossians shows you how to live as a child of God. And it also shows us who Jesus is. He's the king. He's the Lord. He's the master. He's not someone that we're supposed to be speculating about. He's someone we're supposed to fall on our face and obey and say, yes, my Lord. And it's not, it has no contribution or, or, or responsibility on our part of what somebody else might be doing and they're failing. It has to do with me and him. And I'll be held responsible for me. What I say, but you don't understand, they were failing. Therefore, I had to write... And we're going to find out in some of our closing scriptures in the future that there's a Bema seat. That's a seat of judgment. And all judgment's given to Jesus. And you're going to, you're going to have to explain these things to him. And I'm going to have to explain these things to him. And I, I don't think any explanation I have is going to float because I know the truth. I don't think any explanation you have is going to float. So... 
what Paul was trying to get over to the people since they had been hit with so much flying salami was come back to your senses. This is God who you're dealing with. God who will examine everything in your life. God who is preeminent from the beginning to the end. God who you're responsible to. God who you're going to give an answer to. And praise God, this letter woke him up well. And in our next session, we'll be wading off into some of that great stuff about his preeminence. How about we worship?